بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brother Dr. Imtiaz, my dear brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for by His grace and mercy we are able to be here to participate in this very important training program for the future leaders of the Muslim Ummah. You are the future leaders of the Muslim Ummah. And this training is a very important part of becoming the Muslim leaders in your area. Brothers, we are going to go into the new millennium. Um, it's around the corner. And we have to be able to understand what kind of scenario the world is going into in the next millennium, beginning with the year 2000. What kind of scenario do you expect? From my point of view, I would highlight two scenarios, or maybe three scenarios. One is globalization. And second is Christianization. And third, Westernization, or uh, you can also call uh, um, cultural neo imperialism. And these are the three scenarios that I foresee or that we can anticipate in the next 10, 20 years, in the next millennium. Globalization, with um, the collapse of the uh, capitalist, uh, with the collapse of the uh, socialist and the communist systems, there is only one superpower in the world, and that is based in America. And the superpower um, is committed to uh, globalize a capitalistic system where the market is the determining factor in the economy, where all nations will have to open up to this onslaught of, of the market where there are no more borders, all countries are going to be opened up sooner or later. And Muslim countries, Muslim communities are going to be subjected to this onslaught of capitalist economy with the market system dictating terms on all countries. One good example is Indonesia. And many other examples will follow. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, is one of the major arms of this globalization of capitalism. And once the uh, uh, economic problems of so-called developing countries uh, reach a crisis level with uh, a turmoil and, um, uh, and the fall of the currency, either manipulated by the uh, currency speculators or the fund managers in, uh, in, in the uh, capitalist centers, um, then IMF will come in to offer you loans and aids. 
Korea had to submit to it. Indonesia submitted to it. Thailand submitted to it, and many other countries. And once you submit to IMF, you become a slave to it. Then the capitalist um, forces um, and the market forces working hand in hand will then determine your future and will also determine your leadership and your system of government. So Indonesia is a good case study of how a potential Muslim nation with vast resources finally collapsed and had to worship at the altar of market idolatry with the IMF becoming the chief priest telling the people how to worship the new God which is the market economy. There are many forces working behind this new scenario not just capitalists I would imagine also the international Zionist system is working hand in hand with this new force and this is also indicated by the fact that when the new president of Indonesia Abdurrahman Wahid was um, uh, elected a few days ago he mentioned that he would like to establish economic relationship with Israel and he had visited Israel before he is on the Simon Peres Foundation um, so uh, Israel or international Zionism has a big role to play in this new scenario that is to say using the market as a means of dominating nations and making Muslims bow to the demands of the new masters. Second is um, related to this is cultural imperialism. With uh, globalization comes also the um, the new technology, information technology that makes countries uh, and territories and borders irrelevant. Um, all the Muslim countries now uh, can be subjected to this new cultural onslaught coming from non-Muslim countries In Indonesia, for instance, and I want to, because I know better about Indonesia than Africa, you could go to a village, and in almost every house there is this um, uh, TV antenna or satellite dish where you can get um, programs from all over the world, and the village will then be bombarded with this cultural onslaught of uh, hedonism, of cheap entertainment, of Bollywood from India, and uh, of uh, Hong Kong uh, entertainment, Taiwan, and so on, with pornography coming in, uh, in between. And all villages are subjected to that. Thanks to the information technology, uh, available nowadays in all Muslim countries. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you will also see on the houses and the roofs of, uh, of um, people's homes, you have these satellite dishes. In other words, countries have no means to control now the great cultural onslaught coming 
on the heels of globalization. They are actually part of the same strategy to uh, weaken the Muslim faith, to weaken Muslim identity, and to weaken Muslim um, resurgence. As you know, after the, uh, uh, the bipolar world became monopolar, that is um, to say America is the only power in the world that can detect terms, Islam is the only force that is seen by NATO as the new threat. And to Russia, Islam is also the most um, serious threat. The battle in Chechnya and the jihad of the Chechens against this Russian um, determination to extinguish Islamic jihad is um, another manifestation of how the so-called superpowers now have a common enemy. America and Russia, alhamdulillah, are now good friends. And the common enemy is Islamic resurgence. And so when uh, the Chechenians are being slaughtered, you don't see um, NATO coming in to help or United Nations coming in to help. They are there to be slaughtered. So, the, um, the superpowers and the international forces which are against Islam have come up with strategies to weaken the Islamic consciousness in the world. And one way is economic dominance through market tyranny and market um, dictatorship. And second is cultural um, subversion of the Muslims so that Muslims will be singing 24 hours a day, dancing to the tunes of other countries, be it Indian songs or um, Chinese uh, whatever, Hollywood, Bollywood, you name it, we have it. And we are dancing to the tunes of these anti-Islamic forces. The third scenario is Christianization. Many Christians believe that the end of the second millennium will see the resurgence of Christianity. And some fundamentalist Christians are eagerly waiting for the second coming of Christ, which to them signals the triumph of Christianity. Islam is again another stumbling block. Africa, as you know, my brothers from Africa know very well, has been the theater of proselytization of Christianity for the last 100 years. Islam is the main stumbling block, not paganism, but Islam. So Christianization, with backed by the forces of the market and assisted by cultural um, subversion from the media, will again reassert itself in new ways. And brothers from Africa, I think, know the uh, story very well, how uh, Africans are being subverted uh, towards Christianity in a variety of ways. Southeast Asia, uh, brothers from the Philippines are aware that Philippines is um, perhaps the only uh, Christian country uh, in Southeast Asia, a major outpost of Catholicism 
in the Asia Pacific region with Korea, South Korea, another center of Christianity. And with the coming of the next millennium, um, Christianity is going to be more assertive. This is my um, speculation or my anticipation or my prediction. Indonesia is a good example again in this respect. When in the last uh, 10 years of Suharto's regime, he's for some reason or another um, became more Islamic and align himself with Islamic forces in Indonesia. And for, for the first time, Islamic forces were assuming um, dominance in the Indonesian society. Whereas before that, Christian forces were the major determining forces behind uh, Indonesian economy, Indonesian politics, and so on. But uh, with the resurgence of Islam in the 70s and the 80s, Christianity um, had to take a back seat. Now they're coming back again in the front seat through Megawati, the vice president of Indonesia. Behind Megawati are Christian forces. And if Muslims were opposed to Megawati, they were not opposed because she was a woman. But this is what you hear from the media, that the two reasons that uh, Muslims oppose Megawati, number one, she's a woman, number two is Christian forces around her. It's not because she's a woman that they oppose, but because they see her as a tool of the Christians, Chinese as well as others behind her. And she also stood for uh, separation of state and church. So now with the new situation, the president of Indonesia is someone who has very good relations with, um, with Christian um, community. He will be able to stabilize the country. If you talk of political stability, that will be his perhaps major contribution. But um, I suspect that Christian and uh, with the market forces would, be, would assert their presence much more, which will make the Indonesian state compromise one by one their stance. And that would again put the Muslims back on the periphery, not at the center, not in front, but taking a back seat. For Indonesia is a very strategic nation uh, in Asia. She is the largest Muslim country in the world. And if Islam were to uh, be the dominant force, um, that will not be good um, for um, Zionist um, interests in the world or for capitalist um, networks in the world. And so these forces have to make sure that Indonesia succumbed to globalization, to um, uh, cultural uh, imperialism, and also to the demands of Christianity. Brothers, this is my scenario building. I might be wrong, but there are indicators. Now, with these three scenarios, what would be your role? I mentioned in the beginning that you are the leaders of the future of the Muslim Ummah, particularly brothers from Africa, because Africa is the perennial um, stage for this struggle between Islam and the forces of globalization 
Christianization and cultural imperialism. How do you equip yourselves individually and far more important collectively to promote the Islamic agenda in the face of these three serious challenges? There is no time for bickering over small things. One has to be able to see the larger picture and adopt a global omatic mindset, not tribalism, not parochialism or regionalism or nationalism, but Islamic universalism that cuts across boundaries for the technology has made the world a small village. Whether you like it or not, it is going to come. So you better be prepared for it. You're not going to be Gambians or um, South Africans or um, Ugandans. You're going to be the Muslim Ummah of Africa. And the new technology should be seen as an opportunity for the ummatization of Africa, for the globalization of the Islamic agenda. And this kind of course brings you together so that you can work together, plan together, share resources, transfer resources, mobilize resources, seek assistance, harmonize, work together in the face of these serious challenges. The Ummah, unfortunately, as we all know, is in a very sad state of affairs. It is ironic and also shameful that when uh, Kosovo was invaded, we were expecting NATO to deliver it, to save it. This is the reality of the situation. The Muslims had to depend on a non-international Islamic, non-Islamic organization like NATO to come in and help. We have to learn how to be self-reliant. We have to plan for the Ummah. And for that, we need knowledge, we need skills, we need technology. In addition to the strength of faith, the Iman, which is the foundation of the Islamic work for the individual and for the society. So your task, brothers, are very huge. But this is what mu'mins are for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the uh, believers as the people who have sold their lives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ You don't own anything anymore. If you are a mu'min, you have sold your lives, your property to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what? Jihad fi sabilillah. So, but jihad... But jihad takes many forms. There is the spiritual jihad, there is the intellectual jihad, there is a cultural jihad, there is a technological jihad, and of course there is also the military jihad. And we are in no position at this moment to challenge the West militarily. This is a time to equip ourselves with the best knowledge available. 
and to have the best technology to cooperate, to come up with, to, to develop the countries and the nations, the villages, the communities, so that they begin to appreciate the role of Islam in their lives. And here, it is not enough to um, proclaim the word, which is da'wah bil lisan. What the ummah needs is da'wah bil hal. That is, lisan ul hal. Afsahu min lisan al maqal. Which means that you've got to go back and see what to do with the poverty of the people, because this is where Christianity comes in, through poverty. What are we going to do to this illiteracy? What are we going to do to the AIDS problems? How do we improve the health situation? How do we take care of the environment? So, while you, have, you are equipping yourself with jihad or with da'wah bil lisan, you have to find ways and means to bring tangible social work projects down to the village level so that they don't just hear the beauty of Islam, they see the beauty of Islam before them. Because this is precisely the Christian method of proselytization. They do not bring the word. They bring money, they bring food, they bring medicine, they bring care, and so on. Later, they bring the gospel. For most of us, we bring the word first, and then we quarrel among ourselves about the interpretation of the words whether it should be this way, that way, blah, blah, blah. And in the meantime, people are suffering. Sudan, southern Sudan, is a good example of this. Why does it go Christian? Well, because of the abject poverty, and Muslims cannot help, but Christian forces are helping. So the challenge before us, um, brothers, are really daunting. But, as I said, this is our destiny. This is the destiny of the believers. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ أَعْظَمُ دَرَجَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ يُبَشِّرُهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْ وَرِضْوَانٍ وَجَنَّاتٍ لَهُمْ فِيهَا نَعِيمٌ مُقِيمٌ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah says that those who believe and strive in the path of Allah with their selves and their wealth are indeed of the highest status in the sight of Allah. And Allah gives them glad tidings of Al Jannah, and they will be there forever. Then Allah tells us that um, we have to love Him first, the Prophet, and then jihad fi sabilillah. If we are believers, then that should be the hierarchy of love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam and what he stood for and then jihad fi sabilillah. And you hear in this, uh, the next verses, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَاتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اِقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٍ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ 
فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين Say if your fathers or your children or your brothers or your wives and spouses or your um, fellow men or the wealth that you have acquired or the property that you have acquired and um, or the houses that um, uh, that you have um, uh, acquired all these things are material things if these things one two three four five six seven all that if any of these things are more important to you than loving Allah the messenger and jihad fi sabilillah then you have to wait for the penalty of Allah in other words you have misunderstood the priorities in life so for us, brothers and sisters, well, sisters who are not here, because I used to talk to the students in the university, and we have sisters also. And of course, the struggle has to be not just done by the brothers. The sisters have also to play their role. So if we bear in mind that the moment you realize you are mu'mins, you belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have anything more. But that you are getting the highest status in the sight of Allah. And what is there greater than Ridwanullah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I look forward to your um, success in this program. And more important, when you go back to your countries, to Nepal, to South Africa, to Uganda, and other countries, to um, Mindanao, then you have to translate whatever you have acquired here into social realities, into economic realities, into educational realities, and technological realities, and not just become a da'i with great rhetorics but nothing else to give. So I'm sure you will, you will play your role uh, positively and that Allah will reward you and assist us in overcoming the three challenges of globalization or uh, market uh, tyranny and Christianization or Christian proselytization or Westernization and third, the cultural imperialism to dilute the Islamic identity of Muslim youth and Muslim families. I say this and I pray for you 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 and